Hello everyone and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. We're happy you could join us for an hour of answering those garden questions. Just one more show left in our season. So if you have those questions, you better try to get them in this week. You can send those emailed questions and pictures to byf at unl.edu. Tell us as much as you can about your question. Maybe send us a good picture or two. We also really do need to know where you live to give you a better answer. Do not forget to check out Backyard Farmer on our so social media pages, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. And as always, we start with samples. Kyle, it is not an insect. I don't know exactly if you think that's an insect, but it's not. Well, there's an insect egg on here. There you go. <laughs> so um, we've had a lot of questions this year about uh, wheel bugs. And so I wanted to bring uh, a different life stage of that uh, to show, because you might be seeing these showing up in your landscape right now. So here we have uh, an egg cluster for, for wheel bugs. So this is, is very typical. Uh, you'll get, get these clusters lay, laid in sort of a he hexagonal pattern, um, grouped together, and they'll, they'll be glued. Um, they're kind of a darkish, darkish black, brownish egg that has this white cap, and it looks like there's probably an old um, cluster that was from a previous season right next to it. So this is the overwintering stage for wheel bugs. So these will be, you know, the adults will be laying these now. Um, and then this is how they, they will survive the winter, hatch next, next spring, um, and then develop throughout, throughout the summer. So they'll, they'll glue these eggs together, kind of secrete this um, gel or gluey substance over the top, which helps protect these eggs from desiccation, predators, etc. cetera. Um, but um, they, they will lay those typically on uh, branches, sometimes on, on other um, you know, vegetation in the landscape, but it tends to be four feet um, or lower um, up on a branch or something like that. So if you're seeing those around your, your landscape, leave them because those are going to help you out next year. So that's really interesting because we had a lot of questions about yeah. wheel bugs this year and never, we've never seen the eggs on the show. So that's a first. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that. We have seen that, but not like, those things. Right. Well, this is a mole. And in this last week, I got a lot of questions on moles because we had some rain a couple weeks ago. It brought the earthworms up. And the moles want to eat as much as possible with winter coming in. They're still active, but they're active lower in the profile of the soil because they have to be below the freeze level. And there's several ways you can control these moles if they're causing problems in the yard by upheaving the soil. Again, they're eating earthworms. Um, there's this type of trap, and you find a run, and you just pat down a small part of the run, and next time, and you set it, and next time they go through. You probably want to put a um, drywall bucket or a, a five-gallon bucket over the top of this, so dogs and children don't play with it. And, they'll, and when they go through overnight, this will impale the mole, and you could just leave them in the soil, and uh, decay will take place. This one's a little more medieval. Uh, you put it in and actually the scissors opens up and it's really hard to do. And if it goes in, it actually almost cuts the mole in half if he's coming from either way. Um, if you're more of the poison type, these are really the only toxicant that works on moles. There's no poison peanut. They eat earthworms. They don't eat vegetation. Okay, they'll just spit it out and say, what's this for? Okay, but these are um, a type of worm in a matrix that has a special poison for moles who have a hemoglobin that holds oxygen differently because they buffer their oxygen being underground. And you don't want to touch these. You want to wear a rubber glove, poke a hole in the trail, put one in, okay, cover it up with your rubber glove, and then leave it for a couple of days and see if it works. Um, again, don't touch them, and probably wear a mask that you're wearing anyway, so you don't get your breath on these as well, and then they'll eat these and think they're, do not cut them. The poison's only in one little part of them, so you gotta use the whole thing. So will other animals dig those up, or are they? They're not supposed to, and they have vitrin in them and stuff, so if a robin accidentally picks one of these up, it'll spit it out. If a child puts it in his mouth, they're supposed to spit it out. Um, so there is a, um, a resistant, chemical in there called bitrin that's supposed to work for birds and most mammals, but the 
earthworm. I mean, the mole thinks it's an earthworm. Excellent. All right, it is a torture chamber on Backyard Farmer. Yeah. Right? Well, Halloween's coming up at the end of the month. There you go. <laughs> I'm a little frightened now. I think I signed up for the wrong show. Can I leave? <laughs> exactly. Well, and you brought something Halloweenish too, if you're afraid of vampires, right? That's right, and that's how I tell people to remember when it's time to plant garlic, as you need it to repel the vampires at Halloween. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's all different types of garlics. Uh, I have three different varieties here, just to show you uh, the variety. So this is a hard neck uh, garlic called German Red, so it, it won't braid like those nice braids. It has a hard neck in there. And then we have some soft neck garlics. Uh, so this one is Idaho White. Uh, so you can see that's a, a different one there. And then this one is Enchilium Red. Uh, and so it's a nice big clove. And you want those big cloves, uh, big bulbs and cloves like that to plant because then you're gonna get bigger cloves and bulbs next year. Uh, you want to save the smaller ones, like if you go to the grocery store, maybe the farmer's market now, um, these are a bit smaller. You can e use these for cooking, but if you use these to grow, you'll get even smaller bulbs next year. Hmm. Uh, so you want to avoid these, cook these only, and then you wanna make sure you have enough nutrients and water getting to your garlic next season, or you end up with something like this. Uh, so these can be uh, teeny tiny, uh, little garlics, uh, and you know, October is the time to plant garlic. Uh, the way you do it, and this is, I've had people question, they they don't understand how garlic works. It's like, well, if I plant the whole bulb, and then I get a bulb, what's the purpose, right? Uh, and it's actually, you take uh, cloves off, so uh, we wanna take a clove off, one clove, uh, and you stick that in the ground. So you wanna make sure you have this hard plate, that's the, the basal uh, plate of the bulb, that's the stem, and the roots will grow from that. Uh, and you wanna stick it in the ground, pointy, pointy side up. And this point can actually be right at the soil surface. It doesn't have to be very deep. Then you wanna cover with straw or shredded leaves or shredded newspaper mulch. Uh, and it will overwinter, it'll pop up next spring and you'll be harvesting garlic next May through July. Excellent, because I, it, I imagine people do think you plant the whole thing because typically a bulb you right. plant the whole thing. Yeah, excellent. so that's how you plant garlic. All right, excellent, thanks so much. All right, first questions come to you, Kyle. Uh, and this is appropriate yeah. because uh, this is a, an Omaha viewer. What is this insect? Does it bite or destroy plants? And how do you get rid of them and should you? Uh, it's a wheel bug. Mm -hmm. So just, just what I was showing the eggs for. Um, it's, it's not a pest, you know, these are predators, so they're, they're beneficial in the garden. Um, they don't have any interest in you, but it will bite if you if you grab onto it and they have a very painful bite. So um, just leave them alone, let it go, and and um, and let it do its thing in your garden. Excellent. All right. Uh, your next three are actually we had several viewers all of a sudden with this. This particular one is also Omaha. It's a 15 year old Manhattan Euonymus, so the broadleaf evergreen. Usually just treats it with a desiccant. This year it got scale. They used an oil on it with some success, still has white patches, wants to know what to do going into the winter. And I think he sent a couple pictures also that are close-ups of the scale, which has really become devastating on this one. So what do we do when it's that old and that big for scale on Euonymus? Yeah, it's, it's tough. Um, Euonymus scales is pretty challenging to control. These are, are armored scales, so they, um, they, they secrete this very hard, waxy covering. Um, and they do that, at, the crawlers will emerge from eggs and they'll pick a, a feeding site. Once they, they start feeding there, they secrete that covering and they stay there and then they're pretty well protected from treatment. So they're really tough. Um, they do produce two generations a year. Uh, the first is um, May, May to June and then the second one is going to be July and August. So you really want to uh, target that crawler stage um, you can use horticultural oil, oils, um, insecticidal soaps, carbaryl, permethrin um, are all options, but you need to do it during that crawler stage. And um, you, it, that crawler stage emerge, emergence lasts for about two weeks, so a lot of times you need to put down a couple of treatments for those. Um, do the first one, um, you know, late May or something, and maybe about 10 days later uh, when you're seeing those, those crawlers, uh, a second treatment. Um, that can help in something that big. You might also consider using um, 
a systemic to get to get at those and that uh, a midacloprid you could use that's something you would actually want to apply uh, as a soil drench in the fall so probably anytime now you could you could apply that uh, to help control good because I wouldn't have thought of the systemic so. yeah all right excellent we hope that helps that's a nice plant all right Dennis um, this first one is a COZAD viewer so three pictures here, notice holes in a really steep bank to begin with that right. was grasses and perennials. And then last week there were dead spots in the turf. The ground above the bank was lumpy, grass was dead, ground moved, and this creature, which I think is your third picture, uh, was pushing up the soil. Right. Is this a mole? And this viewer thought they did not go that far west. Yeah, uh, moles go all the way west in the state. Yep. And this is the eastern mole and he will go out to Scotts Bluff, um, <laughs> you know, his eastern mole. Visiting. R right. <laughs> no, but, so, and it's definitely mole. Those holes were more water laden because they shouldn't be open, but after you get heavy rains, uh, it opens up their holes. Mm -hmm. So again, we just talked about that. You can use some of those devices on those upheavements, or you can use the um, toxicin, which is in the worm matrix to take care of them. And it's not too late, they're feeding like crazy right now uh, to fatten up um, and go deeper for the winter. So it's, uh, and they're in any kind of soil. There's some areas that don't have as many as others, but they like sandy soil. Um, and they actually travel more in sandy soil because the worms are less prevalent. All right, excellent. And your next one is a Swede bird viewer. Uh, she yeah. saw a mouse, it wasn't active, so she dispatched it and then she walked by and noticed there was this right. insect emerging. So right. This is a deer mouse, yeah. uh, Paramiscus, uh, probably Leucopus. And lots of times when I catch those to do some surveys of what food's there for my snakes, I usually find a lot of, I would say about 25% of them have bot flies. And unfortunately, most of the time they have bot flies, it's, it's in the testicle area of the males. And so I usually pull it out for them. I feel so bad for them. <laughs> um, so what happened, and that bot fly looked like it was close to pupae, but a lot of wild mice have bot flies, especially in the groin area. Not unusual. But the mouse didn't, the, that didn't kill the mouse. No, no, yeah. they, they, they can last quite a bit. And I've, had, I've seen somewhere five or six bot flies. Really? Yeah, and I feel sorry for them, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, you are a critter creature to feel sorry yeah. for a mouse. Well, yeah. It's a mouse. It's a mouse. Well, right. Yeah, you're just a homo, <laughs> homo sapien. <laughs> All right. On that note, let's oh. talk about tomatoes, okay. John. <laughs> this is a, a viewer who uh, has romas that have developed this strange shape, wants to know what causes this and can it be prevented in the future? Well, this is a weird question. Um, I don't think it can be prevented, but it's rare. Uh, so this is something that's called zippering. So if you were to look closely at those seams going across, it almost looks like a zipper, little teeth lined up. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is actually um, a pollination problem that I think is related to weather. And the weather is if it is humid and if it is cool at night. So that can sometimes happen to tomatoes. And what it really is, is the anther from the, the flower, you know, that, that releases the pollen, it gets stuck on the fruit. It doesn't mm. dissolve. And so it, it ends up giving you this weird little zipper across the fruit. It's more common to have them um, up and down, but mm -hmm. they can happen horizontally there as well. So not a thing he can do about it. Not a thing you can do about it. All right. Uh, your next one is a, a red Russian kale. She's grown several other kinds. This one has leaves growing out of the center of the other leaves. And this is a Norfolk viewer. Yeah, this is another weird one. And I tried to research and I couldn't find anything. Like there is nothing about this. Um, what I think is probably there was either some sort of weather event or some sort of damage that caused a little bit of damage on that vein. And the veins of leaves are actually excellent locations for there to be like, if you wanted to take a cutting of a, a like an African violet, mm -hmm. you actually have that vein exposed and that's where the new growth comes from mm -hmm. uh, because that's where the xylem and the phloem and the cambium are on there. And I think there was just some sort of weird signal that signaled that little section of the vein to pop out maybe, maybe 
it's basically a, a baby leaf. Interesting. And then your third one is a uh, picture of a vine, has blueberries, wonders what it is. Is it poisonous? Does it hurt anything? Well, leaves of three, let it be. Right. This is not leaves of three. Right. Uh, this is leaflets of five. Right. Uh, this is Virginia creeper, not poisonous, not harmful. It's basically a weed. Um, Though it's weird, um, you know, I moved here from the East Coast and we actually have seen that in garden centers, people buy it yeah. to plant. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm, I'm from that part of the world and it, you, you try to eradicate it as best you can. So um, no problem with right. it. Some people actually buy it. Oh, I know. And there's a variegated one that people mm -hmm. buy. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And birds love it. That's probably why she had it. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, a sure sign of spring is those bulbs popping out of the ground to deliver that first beautiful pop of color. In order to get that, you have to do some planning and the planting right now. Here's Scott Evans and Mary Jane Froge to tell us more. It's fall. What fall projects do you have planned for this year? One of the things that I'm thinking about doing is how I can incorporate some spring flowering bulbs into our landscape. Right now, the garden centers are chocked full of options. We can buy for best selection, but we wanna make sure that we wait until the soil temperature gets below 60 before we plant. So what are some of your favorite bulbs you like to plant, Mary Jane? I love uh, some of the minor bulbs. One of my favorites is snowdrops. They bloom real early. They're one of the first ones to bloom. They can handle the snow load. They just push on through. And since they're from Europe, the European honeybee will forage on them when the temperatures are in the 40s um, in February and March. One of my other favorites is Scylla. Wow, what a bright blue, beautiful bulb. They're really neat in mass plantings and they naturalize. So they're one that's really nice to have. Something else that's really unique is the checkered lily. Man, that is just a gorgeous flower. Great in groups, group plantings, and just an amazing color scheme on those beautiful lilies. The other one I really like is uh, Snow Glories. Really pretty little flowers, pink, white, and blue. Great to have. So when we're planting bulbs, does it matter what depth? Is it all the same when you're planting them? That is a really good question. The general rule of thumb when we're planting our bulbs is we want to stick them in the ground two to three times as deep as they're tall. So if we have a three inch size bulb, we're going to plant it between six and nine inches deep. One of the best tips I can tell you is if you have a lot of bulbs to plant is to get a bulb auger. It sticks on the end of your drill so that way you can dig those holes quicker. Mary Jane, how can people extend the um, season of the flowers in the spring? Do all the bulbs flower at the same time? No, they don't. Some will bloom real early, some in the middle of the spring, and some late spring. So it's really good to maybe put it down on paper what your plan is if you're doing a big planting, and then you can have them all bloom at once, or maybe in, um, in a wave, some early, some mid, some late, so you always have something blooming during the spring. But put it down on paper and draw it out before you start planting. And one of the questions we get asked quite often is how do we stop the squirrels from digging up those bulbs? And one of the things that we could do is put some chicken wire on top of the ground or hardware cloth, but we need to make sure that we take it off of the ground before those bulbs start to peek through the ground. So that might be early, late winter or early spring. That's a great idea. You hate to have all your work be messed up by squirrels coming in and digging them up. Well, it looks like we've got a great plan. Uh, we'll purchase our bulbs. We can get them locally or we can order online through catalogs and get them planted. And then we'll have beautiful flowers next spring. It is awfully important to make that plan. Remember where those bulbs are planted to avoid any necessary damage over the fall and the winter. Sometimes it's really easy to forget, run the lawnmower over them if they're in the lawn. Make that good plan, stick to it. I use golf tees to mark mine. So then it says I'm digging or trying to move. It's like, what's this? Because you do forget when, those, uh, when they're not showing their beauty. All right, you ready for your next one? I'm ready. So uh, this, this is a Franklin, Nebraska viewer. She says these are on their tree. Are they harmful? They fly around for about an hour and then they're gone. 
These are not harmful. These are really cool beetles, uh, Ripicerids. It's a small family of, of beetles. There's only a few species, and they're commonly called cicada parasite beetles. Um, so it looks like we have a couple of males here that are, are interested in a female. Uh, the males have those you know, really large fan-like antennae. Um, the adults, they don't really feed on anything. Uh, as far as we know, uh, the immatures, they, they um, are parasites of cicada nymphs. So um, we see these late, you know, late in the, the fall and they're just interesting little beetles. Interesting, I don't think we've ever had that one on the show either. All right, so your next one is a Malcolm viewer. Um, he, cleared, he was clearing some Widowmaker ash limbs broken from storms, shows the cambium galleries and the borings. The damage is combined, uh, confined to the deadwood. They have dozens of healthy ash, including the ones that the dead limbs came from. They're always on the lookout for the dreaded EAB. They don't seem consistent, so he wonders what kind of a bore this might be. Yeah, there, there's a couple of things going on here. Um, Definitely agree with the assessment. It's it's not emerald ash borer. Mm -hmm. um, those you would expect uh, more serpentine galleries right here, just below the bark, uh, S-shaped. Um, exit holes would be more D-shaped here. It's it's more cylindrical. So in in the first one, those look like uh, a longhorn beetle. Mm -hmm. um, EAB also won't really go into that sapwood like that. Uh, the shape it's packed with frass there. That's that's pretty consistent with longhorn beetles. A couple of common species are uh, red-headed ash borer and banded ash borers. Um, both of those species, you only find them in, in either recently dead or you know, really, really declining ash. They're, they're not gonna be in, in anything that's healthy, so they're not, they're not really a problem. Um, in the second image, those galleries that were just you know, kind of below the bark there, those uh, look like they're from ash bark beetles. And uh, again, just like the other two species, um, these are only going to be, you know, in in ash that's that's pretty in a pretty sad state already. Um, and this is a pretty characteristic pattern. So just below the bark, uh, the, the adults will bore in, and then they'll they'll sort of make these galleries going across uh, from one side to the next, uh, those deeper galleries. And uh, as the female is boring doing that, she's laying eggs in that gallery. And when those larvae hatch, then they they bore up and down, making those uh, sort of branches uh, in, in those branching galleries in there. So that's pretty characteristic for them, but, uh, but not, not going to be a problem in healthy trees. Excellent. Thanks, Kyle. All right, Dennis, uh, this is a Lincoln viewer who has, a, has actually the, the, the critter question is this one, which is, are bats or mice eating the tomatoes? He never sees birds. He doesn't see vermin. Mm -hmm. He does see bats in the neighborhood. And if the bats are eating the tomatoes. If he covered them with a net, could he keep that from happening? Bats only eat flying insects. Mm -hmm. They're 100% carnivores, so they wouldn't touch any fruit at all. Fruit bats are in South America and the Caribbean. All the bats in Nebraska are, they only eat flying insects. Mm -hmm. um, but by the teeth marks, when I was looking at these, this is a squirrel or a ground squirrel. They're, the teeth marks are too big for a vole. And so you have either a tree squirrel climbing up or a 13 line ground squirrel. Uh, some of the teeth marks were smaller than others. But by the amount of the size of the bites, I'm, I'm going more towards the tree squirrel. Okay, which would be classic tree squirrel. Yep. Yep, mm -hmm. all right. So uh, your next one, Dennis, this viewer said uh, in one night when the temps were in the upper 50s, something started tunneling in numerous areas around the back porch even under the bricks and under the splash block. She wonders what she can do with it and what to do about the holes. So lots of this well, from this person. Right. So it's, it might be voles or um, they're a little bit bigger than voles and a little more aggressive, but I would start with voles and probably put up uh, like pea gravel, stuff pea gravel down those holes and pack it and then put the dirt over the top of it so the grass can grow into the pea gravel. Um, that'll stop them from one way. If they reconstitute re the hole, uh, you can use um, one of those multi traps with a little bit of bird seed or grass seed as bait, the multi catch traps, the box traps. All right, thank you so much. All right, John, um, this is a Lincoln viewer, has a very large magnolia, lost all of its leaves this year on a major branch. The rest of the tree looks pretty healthy. I think she sent us two pictures here. 
there, there are buds, the, the flower buds are on the branches. So she's wondering, will the bare branches leaf out next spring since there are buds? Should she wait to prune this? I mean, so losing all those leaves, that's indi you know, an indicator that there's something going on with that branch. Mm -hmm. So even if it leaves back out, you may not want to have it on the tree. So you might want to think about going ahead and having that pruned out and seeing you know, how the tree does, you know, it'll be a sort of a, a lopsided tree. So you have to think about that. This is a pretty big, pretty old tree. And we, you know, just like humans, trees, they have, you know, certain limits. And as they get older, they're going to start losing bits and, and pieces. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, there will be a, an, a point where there will be an inevitable point that yeah. the tree will be gone. But you can you can keep pruning stuff off until then. All right. Thanks, John. Uh, your next one is a Sydney viewer, uh, and he is wondering why the tree is two-tone. This is an autumn blaze maple, I think. Uh, red leaves on the southeast side, green leaves on the northwest side, and um, very interesting. Yeah, so this could be, so probably, you know, the most benign and simplest answer would be that that direct sunlight that that gets on the south side basically speeds up that, you know, that process in the fall. So you get you know, the leaf change on one side before you get the leaf change on the other. And it's very interesting, very striking. You do want to watch out because sometimes leaves, uh, trees will t change color early in the summer as a stress. So there could be like root girdling on that side of the tree or a root issue on that side of the tree. Um, you know, and our, our hot and dry weather can exacerbate those problems. So you want to watch out, just be on the lookout, but it could just be that one side gets more sun than the other. Plants are weird. <laughs> All right, thanks, John. Well, our garden this year has exceeded even our expectations. We did get a late start. We had some wacky weather. Mother Nature does always find a way. So here's Terry James to highlight what happened this year in the Backyard Farmer Garden. This year in the Backyard Farmer Garden, it actually turned out really fantastic. Remember, we um, were in quarantine and most of the garden, actually all of the garden, really didn't even start getting planted until the 1st of June. So our garden looked fantastic considering that. Our containers looked really good. We had some real winners on some of our new herbs. That upright basil was a real hit. We were able to get fall crops in, so we're looking forward to kind of harvesting that. Uh, we grew a lot of produce for our food bank uh, donations, up almost 800 pounds of produce that we were able to donate out of the backyard farmer garden. We took a lot of notes. We know what we liked, what we didn't like, but our garden is still gonna look fantastic until probably mid to late October. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out one last time. And right now it is time for lightning. You ready, John? I'm ready. All right. Uh, this viewer wants to know whether they can leave their carrots and their parsnips in the ground after it freezes. And if so, for how long? You can until it really gets cold. You want to use some sort of row cover and that'll extend. All right. Uh, we have a viewer whose celebrity tomato snapped with four to five green fruits still on the stem. She put that in water with plant start. They turned red. Should she eat those? Yeah, that's fine. All right. This is a Henderson viewer wondering, is it a bad year for pumpkins? Well, it really depends. There's lots of things like groundhogs ate all of mine, so. <laughs> Bad Your problem, year. Dennis. Um, we have a York viewer who wonders whether the heat from last week will destroy all those fall cool crops that were just coming up out of the ground nicely. Uh, if they didn't dry out, that's fine. If you let them dry out, probably. All right. What was the best tomato from your AAS trial? I can't tell you. I'd have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know. That's a number. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If we order seeds now so they don't run out of seeds, how do you store them for the winter? The best place to store seeds is in a, a, a plastic bag in the freezer. Excellent. Freezer or, or refrigerator? Freezer because the fridge is too moist. You want moist. freezer. Excellent. Thanks. All right. Dennis, mm -hmm. 
Your first one here, uh, this is a Gothenburg viewer who wants to, do, to know what they can do to keep squirrels from chewing on their deck steps. Uh, mix cayenne pepper with vegetable oil and paint it on that area. It's territorial marking. All right. <laughs> we have a David City viewer who uses a salt de-icer that he says is unsafe for humans, but then he sees critters licking it in the spring. Is it harmful to the critters? If they're licking it, it's probably not harmful to those critters. Um, many mammals need salt, and so they'll, they'll utilize it. Squirrels right. will lick the All road right. for salt. All right. We have an Omaha viewer who wonders whether it would be a mole or a vole going after grubs in the lawn. Neither of them, probably more a raccoon, but if it's going to be one of those two, it'll be a mole, never the vole. All right. We have an Aurora viewer who had toads in a window well. Should they leave them there over winter or relocate them so they'll live? They probably fell in, so take them out and don't move them more than 100 yards. All right. Where do you get those dryer vent covers that you showed on air last week? Online. Just Google dryer vent covers. All right. Nice job. All right, Kyle. Ready? I'm ready. White flies outside on everything. This is a Juniata viewer. Why and what do you do? I have no idea why. Um, I've not seen them this bad here before. Mm -hmm. uh, really, this time of year, I, nothing. Perfect. So we have an Omaha viewer who has carpenter ants uh, along the baseboards and in the door opening. She says the store sprays are not working. Yeah, that's probably not going to work for carpenter ants. Um, I would recommend working with professional exterminator. Mm -hmm. All right. This is a Crete viewer who wonders if white flies overwinter, and if so, where? Uh, not in Nebraska, uh, further south. All right. We have a Grand Island viewer who wants to know how to get wasps out of the wren houses and keep them out. Ooh. Um, you can pass. Yeah, I'll, I'll pass that one. <laughs> what are the... <laughs> we have an Audubon, <laughs> Iowa viewer who says there are white flakes on the white pine. Is that aphids or spider mites on the branches? Um, that's probably, probably neither, probably a, a scale. All right, excellent. Nice job, all. Plants of the week, John. Okay, well, some uh, fall color from the garden here. Uh, this is a sedum. This is autumn fire. Uh, it stands a little more upright and doesn't fall over, unlike the autumn joy, which is the more common one you'll find. Also has a darker color. The autumn joy, which is very common, has a lighter, almost, you know, slight pinkish kind of color. So uh, Kim likes this one better, she tells me. I do like uh, better. <laughs> and then uh, this is a penstemon. Uh, you'll notice it's gone to seed. This is dark towers. Uh, so it has these really interesting seed heads. It'll drop its seed. Uh, so it's a nice uh, garden plant. Those seed heads will stay all winter. Uh, so you have a little winter interest in the garden. Excellent. Thank you so much, John. All right, questions, Kyle. This is a uh, this is a Lincoln viewer and wonders what kind of insect has done this damage to these apples in Lincoln. Yeah, this I don't know. I'm so I'm not sure. In the very top, very top kind of uh, left side there, there's a little hole with kind of a ring around it. Mm -hmm. That looks like it looks somewhat similar to like codling moth uh, when they enter. So I don't know if that maybe could have been in there at some point. But all this other, you know, in, injury on there, I don't, I'm not sure that that's, that's from an insect. I know a bunch of insects will go, will go to uh, apples when they've like fallen off, they're rotting and, and fermenting. You'll find all kinds of wasps and, and whatnot, but I, I don't know, would a critter do that? I don't see any teeth marks. It looks more like a fungus or a mole, a rot, mm -hmm. but I would have to see it closer to see if there's any, if the teeth marks were there, it was very early on. Right. And then the fungus got in there, and then the insects got in there. Yeah, yeah, it could be like you one, have everything. You have you, you, you yeah, have one disease. thing set the yeah. set the ball in motion, right. and it yeah. kept going. Yeah. You know, if, if other Kyle was here, he'd tell us just to cut around it and eat it. You know. Oh, yeah. I know it. <laughs> and we'd all say, "Yeah, no, not doing that." <laughs> all right, your next one is not quite as grody. This is a uh, Lake Wakanda sycamore. And this sort of interesting web mass is sort of this cone-shaped thing. The bark was loose and fell off at this spot. I, I don't know what this is. Um, there's sycamore tussock moth, um, which will, they'll, they'll pupate and make this cocoon, sometimes in crevices in the bark. I, 
I'm not convinced that that's what it is. Um, some spiders, mm -hmm. I, I, I wish I knew how big this was. Some spiders will make, uh, will, will kind of cover their egg sacs in silk like this. Mm -hmm. That could be a possibility, um, but you know, I'm speculating on both, I'm not sure. Yeah, all right. And your next one is a Bennington viewer. What is this insect and it, is it harmful? He's lived here 17 years and has never seen one of those before. It's uh, another cicada parasite beetle. This is, mm. the, this is the female and they will see them well into October. Excellent, how about that? Two in a row. Yeah. All right, Dennis, uh, your next one. This is a South Lincoln viewer. This is south facing the parkway area fescue, uh, the area sort of lies down a little. It's very wet at some points, especially when it rains. The grass is pulling up in clumps, not much of a root system, no grubs. Any advice what kind of a creature this might be? Well, it could be a bird looking for earthworms, or it could be an opossum looking for worms, or a skunk when you see small tufts pulled up and not rolled back like raccoons. And it doesn't have to be grubs. It could be any soil insect that they're after. You know, mm -hmm. it could be you know earthworms and even massive amounts of ants. That these animals like. But the fact that tufts are pulled up, I would go birds or opossum. Okay. All right. And your next one is a papillion viewer who thought they had a mole or a vole problem until he he saw a gigantic raccoon tearing up the lawn. Uh, wondered if there was a humane way to scare him off and I said cover the bird seed because he get rid of the bird seed he had right. bird seed and things but he said it's now digging constantly in the grass and has three babies following it into the yard so he's wondering what can he do can he can he can he trap can he what can he do right trapping is the really the only legal uh, method inside the city limits or within three miles of the city limits uh, box trapping and you would use marshmallows as a um, bait hanging from the trap with a piece of burlap over it. And then you can call the Humane Society to have the animal uh, taken away. If, depending on where you're at, you'll have to call to find out who's willing to take it away. Um, but yeah, so um, they're after grubs, they're usually grubs, so it usually means there's grubs. If raccoons are rolling back the sod, that usually means grubs. All right, thanks, Dennis. All right, John, you have an identification here. This is a viewer that had a couple actually, and this first one, this is kind of a prairie or a, a, a ditch species. Any idea on what this is? So this is a, an aster, so it's a, a wildflower. So I guess it depends on your, um, on your perspective, whether it's a weed or not. It's a great pollinator plant. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually just planted some of this in my garden. Uh, I got it in the bloom box from the, the statewide arboretum. Uh, but it is just a wild, a wild aster. It'll, you know, so love it or leave it. <laughs> All right, and then your next one is a Holdridge viewer. What is this beautiful plant? But it gets brown, so it's beautiful on top and from the bottom up. Gets brown starting at the soil, increases. It is in full sun south side of the house. So. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a purple aster. Uh, this is uh, you know, something that you would go and, and buy and put in your garden. Uh, and these are great because a lot of people buy mums this time of year thinking that they're going to overwinter and they don't. Mm -hmm. These are actually perennial and we plant these. We have these, a lot of these in our, in our garden. Uh, and uh, that browning, I think that's probably just that cultivar. Uh, and some of them do this. It's the older leaves that are in the center so they don't get a lot of light. Mm -hmm. um, probably dried out some in the heat. So it's just that variety does that. It's nothing wrong with it. Right, and that's, I think that one's probably Purple Dome and that yeah. one does that. Yeah, so some varieties do that more than others. Right, yeah. yep. Well, if you've recently moved or you just plain don't know what kind of grass is in your yard, fixing the problem areas is going to be next to impossible. Our turf expert, Rock Gaswa, has a few tips to share with you. You might need to get out a magnifying glass to follow along. We often give recommendations based on what species or what type of turf grass you have. But the interesting thing is, is that most people can't tell what turf grass they have. So today we're going to spend a little bit of time going through the anatomical structures in a grass plant and help you understand how you can distinguish tall fescue from bluegrass, uh, Kentucky bluegrass from 
buffalo grass, buffalo grass from zoysia, any of the grasses that we commonly see. So let's start by talking about the structures on a grass plant. Number one is how does that leaf emerge from the stem? We call that the vernation. When, when the leaf comes out of the stem, it can either come out folded or it can come out rolled. The grasses that come out folded will have a distinct midrib. The grasses that come out rolled will not have a distinct midrib. Two examples are Kentucky bluegrass, which has a distinct midrib in the center of the grass leaf blade, versus tall fescue, which has more, a more uniform appearance. Tall fescue is rolled out of the bud. Kentucky bluegrass is folded out of the bud. Another thing we want to talk about is growth habit. Does it have rhizomes? Does it have stolons? Or does it have none, which would be a bunch grass? And finally, things like color. Color isn't the best identifier, but at the end of the day, it does a pretty good job helping you understand um, or distinguish between certain grasses. The blue-green color of buffalo grass, for example, versus the emerald green color of Kentucky bluegrass and the dark, vivid green color of tall fescue. So let's take a look at those structures and the individual grasses, and then you can go out on your lawn and determine which is which. Let's take a look at tall fescue. It's rolled in the bud, so there's not a distinct midrib. Um, its growth habit is primarily bunch, which means you won't see rhizomes and stolons, although a few tall fescue varieties do have very small rhizomes. It has a very rough leaf texture. If you run your finger across the leaf from the top down, you'll get kind of a sandpapery feel that you won't see in many of the other grasses. Kentucky bluegrass. Kentucky bluegrass is folded in the bud, so it has a distinct midrib. Um, it has rhizomes, so if you were to stick a shovel in the ground and pull back and you see those really stemmy, whitish things in the ground that are not roots, those are rhizomes, that would be, it could be Kentucky bluegrass. The, one of the key identifiers of any of the bluegrass species, not only Kentucky bluegrass, but uh, uh, rough bluegrass as well as annual bluegrass, is it looks like a boat shape at the end of the leaf blade prior to mowing. We call it a keel. It looks like a boat keel, and that's a real distinct identifier. Buffalo grass. Now we're talking about warm season grasses. The warm season grass buffalo grass is rolled in the bud. It has stolons and it has a bluish green color. So sometimes bluegrass next to um, buffalo grass is that you can tell simply by the color. And it has two different kinds of seed head, a bushy one, which is the male seed head on the surface, and down below the seed pod. And finally, zoysia grass. My least favorite grass of grass is all the grasses grown in the state of Nebraska. It's also a warm season grass. It is rolled in the uh, bud. It, it is, uh, has, has rhizomes, so often that's how you tell it apart from buffalo grass in addition to being much thicker and denser. A more emerald green color, um, and uh, I rarely see seed heads on zoysia grass, but when you do, they're unique and a little bit like crabgrass. So now you have the majority of the information you need to correctly identify what's in your lawn. Because if you just look from the sidewalk, it's really difficult to tell. Now that you have this, you can choose the best management based on the university's recommendation or recommendations of others to make your lawn the best lawn on the block. Figuring out what species of grass you have is really the first step toward that good management. Most of us have either Kentucky bluegrass or tall fescue. You do have to know which one you have to take care of it properly or as a couple of us talked, if it's green, you mow it and call it good. No, <laughs> there we go. All right, Kyle, um, this is Little Sioux, Iowa. They had this moth on the door of the shed. Is it harmful and is it a large tolype, T-O-L-Y-P-E moth? It, it is, yeah, a large uh, tolipi, I think okay. is how it's pronounced. I'm, I'm not 100% certain, but yeah. um, it's not harmful. The, the larvae feed on um, you know, a variety of broadleaf trees, uh, apple, uh, birch, oak, um, just a large variety, but they're not going to hurt anything in the garden. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even look like a moth. It looks like, I don't know what it looks like. Well, the, the name, that Greek, uh, it comes from the Greek meaning like ball of cotton, the, the genus oh. name. So that's, there, there you, you go. go. All right, and then uh, this is a Lincoln viewer. What is this? Noticed it in the shrubs this morning. It's about six inches long, and she says it looks like an alien. Um, this is a common green darner. So it's a, it's a large, uh, really beautiful, showy uh, dragonfly. Mm -hmm. It's either, either an immature male or a female. I'm not sure. Um, 
But um, these are, are migratory um, dragonflies, so they're, they're one of the first that will show up here in the, the spring before our native ones have, have sort of uh, emerged. And, um, and then they'll you know, have a generation, those will emerge in the late, late summer, and uh, then they'll migrate back south. Interesting. All right, uh, Dennis, this mm -hmm. is a turtle that was caught at a lake by Platte River in Sarpy County. They wonder what this one is. It's a hatchling spiny soft shell. And that's their soft scales. All turtles have scales, just that there's a few. The leatherbacks and the soft shells have flexible alpha carotene scales. But just, yeah, it's just a native species, very common, and they hatch this time of year. And how big will that little hatch be? About as big get? as a dinner plate. Wow. When they went about 25 to 40 years from now, <laughs> it'll get that big. You gotta remember, turtles last live 50, 60 years. So, right, yeah. if, if something doesn't eat them. Right, yeah. All right. Yeah. So then your next one is a, uh, what is this little darling? Oh, woodchuck or groundhog. Mm -hmm. Nice guy. Um, Very good looking guy. I, I mean, for a woodchuck, you know, sleep. I, I have to say it's a good looking woodchuck. He looks like he's been on a good diet of pumpkins. Or something. Yeah, right. pumpkins or cucumbers or zucchini. They yep. like zucchini. Yeah, and in someone's backyard. So is he going to cause some damage here? They like to live under decks and sheds, and they usually have one hole. If you ha don't have a lot of cubic fruit, then they wouldn't do too much damage. But they could put they, their burrows are about 20 foot deep. So if, you, if, you, if they're burrowing under your, your deck or your shed, put a lot of lava rock in there during the day because they're diurnal. They come out during the day and they sleep at night, like us, most of us. Mm -hmm. And so you definitely want to make sure you do that. All right. So your next one is, uh, this is a skeleton ID. She, she yep. saw this in a trash can. Um, she wondered what this is. So. It's not going to cause you any more problems. Um, yeah. <laughs> great for Halloween in the month. Yeah. Uh, it's got canines. It's got small incisors and cadenasials and premolars. So it might be a young fox or a young canine, like a domesticated puppy. Mm -hmm. So it's either a young fox or a puppy. Mm, too bad. Yeah, yep. either way on that yeah. one. All right. Um, John, this viewer has a beautiful planter, South Covered Porch. This is in Battle Creek. He wants to bring this whole planter into his garage, and which is heated. He has a grow light. He wonders, will be, he be able to keep it looking beautiful? If so, how to do that? And a part of that is... What does he use to kill whatever uh, of Kyle's insects are hitching a ride on that? Right, so keeping that beautiful over the winter will be difficult. So most of those are annuals, uh, at least annuals here. I mean, they are like perennial tropical plants, so they can be happy year round, but typically not indoors, because even though you have a grow light and you have heat, it's not an, usually enough. So, um, you know, you might be able to keep them alive, happy and looking good, that will be much less likely. Um, you know, unless you know there's insects, we don't typically tell you to do a lot of treatment. Um, you know, if you think there will be insects, you could do something like a, there is a, a, a product called like a house plant systemic, which you would apply. And that would be like, it would be taken up by the plant and protect them throughout their, their time indoors. All right, excellent. Your next one is a Millard Omaha viewer. She said her pine was fine until they had the extremely hot days. Then the needles on the inside turned brown almost overnight. The ends are green. What's up with that? Yeah, so the inside needles dying and the outside needles staying green, that almost makes me think that could just be the old needles that they're dying. You know, trees will shed their old needles at some point. So that could definitely uh, be the case could have been sped up by the hot weather. Trees were really not having a good time this summer, um, drying out and with the heat. So there could, been, could have been some damage, some extra damage from that other than the, the old needles. And if it were the outer um, needles or specific branches that turn brown more than others, you know, you wanna keep an eye out for diseases, but this just looks like it's a normal process to me. All right, your next one is, um 
This is hostas planted under an old crab apple in North Platte. They've done well for about three years, but three weeks ago they started doing this. No changes to watering, though he does say uh, it's been extra dry in North Platte. Yeah, so the no changes to watering, so you know, you have a normal watering routine and that is for like normal weather. Uh, during this hot, dry uh, weather, uh, you probably needed to water more uh, just because plants are using so much water when it's so dry and so hot. So you wanna do that for about anything. Otherwise, they're gonna be like this and you know, it'll be, you know, as, as Arnold used to say, hasta la vista. Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> gotta, sneak, gotta sneak a bad joke in there somewhere. Absolutely. Yeah, and the crab apple will be taking what it needs anyway. Yeah, so yeah. and there is competition there between right. those plants. Right, exactly. All right, give it a drink. All right, uh, Kyle, we have some time for some questions okay. without pictures. And uh, this first one here is an Omaha viewer. She has a beautiful bittersweet plant, very healthy, but this week she noticed all this white stuff on the bark and the leaves. And of course, this is a euonymus related to it. She can scratch it off and it's on the top, on the bottom, all over the stems. Scale again? Yeah, euonymus scale. Um, you know, it, <clears throat> It's hard to say without seeing it. Mm -hmm. One thing I don't think I mentioned earlier when I was talking about it, but could also be another option is, is pruning, you know, removing mm -hmm. if, if you have some areas that are real heavily infested, mm -hmm. uh, other areas that aren't, that, that might be another thing to consider with that. All right, yeah, and, and again, that's, I know with a lot of the euonymus, the big ones, you take it to the ground at least to eliminate it to begin with and then spray next year. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Dennis, this mm -hmm. is a Creighton, Nebraska viewer. Okay. Um, this is um, women who quilt in the basement of the church have found bat droppings. They're concerned about how to get rid of the bats. They know they're not supposed to kill them. How do you get rid of the bats in the basement of the church? Two things. One, any bat droppings you pick up wet. Don't sweep or vacuum. You, because that it makes the fungus in the bat droppings become aerosol. Mm -hmm. So mouse and bat droppings you always wet and clean up with a sponge, never sweep or vacuum. You have to exclude the bats. And now is the time before they go in 100%. So there's exclusion one-way doors that I, you can go to our website and find out all about those. Make sure they're all out and then plug all the holes up. It's all exclusion. There is no bait, there is no poison, there is no repellent that works. It's all exclusion. All right, and if they can't do that themselves, they're gonna- They can hire someone to exclude, yeah. 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 All right. I thought bats were usually in the belfry, not in the basement. They can be either place. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. But I think probably they were in the belfry and oh. came to the basement. But, okay. It got <laughs> too hot in the belfry. There. It got too hot in the belfry. Exactly. Maybe there's snacks down there. Yeah. Well, they, they rang the bell too much. Okay. Yeah. And they would like to quilt. <laughs> you know, winter's coming. Those bats want a little quilt. They, they look, keep them warm, right? Keep them yeah. warm. Yeah. I yeah. think we're better off with a lot of announcements at the end of the show. <laughs> <laughs> but you do have a question, John. Oh, okay. So we are, go we are going into fall. We are in fall. Um, what are you going to advise people to do for watering their plants, especially older trees and shrubs? Well, I mean, older trees and shrubs, you still want to keep them watering until, you know, basically the ground freezes. They need to take up that water. Once mm -hmm. the ground freezes, they're not going to be able to do that. Uh, so you want to keep them well watered, especially since we've had a drier year. Uh, what you'll see is more winter damage next year or over the winter will appear next year if you don't keep them watered enough. Right. And we did have a, a, a viewer ask, should they use one of those root things to put the, the root feeder things with the hose on it to put the water down deeper or just go ahead and run the hose slowly. Just run the hose. That makes a big, through the drip line. Yes, throughout the whole drip line. One, little areas of water don't help. There's roots all around. <laughs> all right, and they all need water. And they all need water. All right, excellent. Well, good advice, get out the hose because it's gonna be really hot and has been hot, mm -hmm. really been hot.